Okay, on the bench is this Zenith uh, radio. It's a model 6S229. Um, of course, it has the uh, normal problem set an antique radio has, which is bad electrolytic capacitors and bad paper wax capacitors. Um, but I, I will show you what I got going here. Um, I did hook up a wire to use as an antenna, should it give me some kind of noise. I did bring it up slowly on my isolation transformer here, which I will turn back on again. And turn the set on, bring the volume up to the top. And as I bring the, vo the voltage up here, which you'll see popping up on that meter, Okay, I'm at 65 volts right now. Give the tubes a second. It's drawing 180 milliamps. Okay, I'm gonna bring it up a little more. Okay, we're up to 80 volts. And you hear that hum? That, that's your electrolytic capacitors humming. Right now, if this was getting full voltage um, without a current limiting light bulb, which I got up there, that hum would be doing damage to irreplaceable parts of the radio. <clears throat> you got a couple other issues. This volume control. Okay. Okay, that's a whole different issue. Um, the tuning only goes to there, so it'll go from there to there, and that's as far as it goes, so it's not moving. The tuning needs to be adjusted. Basically, this here on the 56, or 50, yeah, 56 on this one, usually it's 55, but 55 is right there. Uh, 55, that needle should go all the way over to the high end here. This one would swing around the bottom the other way. So this is in um, kilohertz, which you would normally see on like a transistor radio, 55, 60, 65, 70, all the way up to 170, uh, 1700 kilohertz. Um, and this one is in decimal, okay, 5.6 kilohertz to 18 kilohertz. Anyway, it's the same thing. The needle, the needle would go all the way around. And this is just a sweep that goes around so you can fine tune, you know what I mean? You'd be on a particular number, any one, and then you can fine tune with that. But, doesn't want to go past that so the string's slipping basically if I put a little pressure on it it does a little better and this this is tone here you can hear the bass and treble so that's working volume control just seriously needs to be cleaned put it all on treble you can hear it crackly it needs to be cleaned and this is your band selector so broadcast, uh, C and A. So A, C, and B. I'm assuming B is broadcast. May not be. I haven't pulled up the schematic yet on this one. But uh, yeah, it's got shortwave on there as well. So anyway, um, right now, with the current limiting bulb, it's drawing 250 milliamps. You see, it says 25 there, 0.25. So it's 0.250 or 250 milliamps, 0.25 amps. And voltage-wise, I'm on 80 volts. I don't want to bring it any higher. This is a transformer set, so even at 80 volts, it's probably running right now at around 150 volts DC. So I'm going to bring it down and shut it off.
and the next thing for me to do, there's no sense in worrying about the wire, uh, is take it out and recap it. It has to be recapped and then it needs to be tuned. Now this guy that was in the back, this is a 19, probably 1960s AM antenna from an All-American 5 radio, okay? Sorry for the shaky camera. It's just I'm trying to do so many things. It's easier to do it this way. Um, this is from a little desktop radio, a small little radio that sits on the desktop. Five tube, all American five radio. It's not for this. This these units do not use. These antennas weren't even invented yet. This uses a wire, a long wire like this that you would stretch out. And a lot of people back in the day would run them from tree to tree in their backyard, or you can run them around the baseboard in your house. Um, if we get the radio performing, without that wire, you should be able to get any local station that's really close to you. Uh, if there are no local stations close to you, then yeah, you would need a wire. The length of the wire would depend on how many stations you want to get in and how far away they are. Um, if they're like 10 miles away, you won't need a wire. If they're 30 miles away, you'd need a wire. If there's a lot of trees, mountains, hills, you probably need a wire running outside or, or around the baseboard to get uh, those stations. Um, now on shortwave, you'd probably get a little further. And at night, you would get um, skip or these. Uh, um, you get the signal bouncing off the ionosphere. Um, DX is what people call it for short, but basically it's uh, it's as though the radio station in, in say, Honolulu or uh, Trinidad was right in your backyard. It's just bouncing up and down off the ionosphere, and it comes right down right where you are at. And so the... On, on, the, on those times at night, you'll hear a distant station way far away, and then it'll all of a sudden start getting louder and louder and louder until it sounds like you're right at a local station, and then it'll slowly dissipate and go down, and that's uh, it moving across the ionosphere. And it's fun to listen to those stations because you can hear stations from all over the place, all around the globe, actually, at times. Um but right now, what i got to do is take the radio out of the case and uh, go from there. Let me show you the inside here, which you've already seen, I'm sure. Okay. What I did is I just wrapped my little antenna wire around this particular part of the tuning condenser. This is your tuning capacitor, a tuning condenser, it's called. And if I take that off there... A little hard to do with one hand. Apparently, I put it on pretty good. Okay. You'll notice. You'll notice this one has a lump of solder here, and it has a wire that comes over to here to this tube. Okay, that's going to um, your mixer tube. This one here also has a solder on it, but there's no wire. You see, the piece of wire is broke off. That would be this wire that they would have used back in the day to get radio stations, and it would come from there and go out. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? These tubes are probably fine. This is a um, uh, six-tube radio. and Actually, yeah, six-tube radio. So the... Um, the IF frequency that we tune this radio to is listed on top of these IF cans, and it's 456 kilocycles, KC, or what we would say today, kilohertz. So 456 kilohertz is what this radio is tuned at and uh, to get the stations. And so that's where we're at. Now, this is a... This is not a permanent magnet speaker. Back when they made these radios, they had a coil here, and that's a field coil. So in a way they had a magnet here is they would run current through this coil, and it would magnetize this metal rod, just like in, when you're in school and you wrap a wire around a, 
a nail or a screwdriver or whatever and run a battery across it, you, all of a sudden you got a magnet. You can pick things up. Well, that's how they made a magnet out of this. So modern speakers, this pole that goes through to the front, to the speaker coil, is a magnet, permanent magnet. But back in the day, they didn't have permanent magnets, so they made them out of a field coil. The advantage of doing this was twofold. One, you had a magnet, electromagnet, from, from the electricity going through the coil. But also, they would double this as a choke coil along with the filter capacitors in order to get rid of that hum that we were hearing. Now, of course, the field coil is still good, and it's doing what it's supposed to do. But this is not. This is your filter capacitor. There's probably two, maybe three capacitors in this can, and they are long bad, long dead. So what we do is we leave the can because it looks nice, right? We don't want to take the can out. It's, it's cool looking. We just cut the leads on the bottom of the can, and we put new capacitors on the bottom of the can, and they're, like, really small. Back then, they were really big because they were new, right? New invention. Think Edison. Now, the back of this is exposed. That's not a problem for back then. People knew better than to put their hand in here. But just FYI, this radio runs at around 375 volts when it's fully powered up. This is a step-up transformer. It takes the AC line voltage coming through your AC line, 120 volts AC, and it kicks it up to around close to 400 volts. And then that's rectified through your rectifier tube which turns it into DC, which powers the radio, because the radio runs on DC, and it's around 375 volts. So this radio is charged uh, at real high voltage. You definitely don't want to be playing with this on any radio. You don't want to put your hand in here. Now, they knew better in the day, but, you know, this is... To us, this is like something that came out of a UFO, right? We don't know a thing about it, right, today? So we don't know what they knew. As, just like, you know, we know today, you don't stick your hand in a toaster, right? It's hot. You'll get burnt. Well, back then, they knew not to stick their hand in the back of a radio. So just bear that in mind. Um, I'm glad you replaced the, radio, the line cord because the old line cord, I'm sure, was short, shorted, and that's 120 volts AC. Okay, what else can I tell you? Okay, so we need to change these electrolytic capacitors. There's also paper and wax capacitors underneath. They need to be changed too. And once I get the chassis out, I'll show you those. Um, the speaker here is not an 8-ohm speaker, okay? It tells you right there, it's 1,250 ohms. I don't know if you can see that, maybe if I move the light away a little. Okay, it's 1,250 ohms. Well, that 1,250 ohms is this field coil, not the speaker. The speaker on this, well, we don't know. It could be 32 ohms, it could be 60 ohms, it could be 17 ohms, it could be any kind of resistor. So you can't just use any speaker, right? The speaker is important for two reasons. One, it needs a field coil, and two, it has a resistance that doesn't match up with today's modern speakers. Um, that said, you can make them work. You just got to change this output transformer, and that's what this is. On newer radios, and radios that have this, most likely, or a lot of them, this would be on the chassis, and even some of the older ones had it on the chassis. It's sort of like this. This is a transformer. This is a transformer. And so they'd have been on the chassis. Well, back here, they put them on the speaker, and the, the way they work is your output tube has an impedance, what's called an impedance. It's a range of resistance that this tube needs to see. And so the speaker needs to see a low resistance. The tube needs to see a high resistance. So just like this takes low voltage and makes it high voltage, this takes a high impedance and converts it down to low impedance for the speaker, and that's how they work. But this transformer is matched to this speaker and the output tube. 
it's not matched it would not work on just any old radio it's made for to make this tube work with this speaker so like hooking up external speakers like we do today on a stereo we run speakers all over the place or on a tv set or whatever you can't do that with this so just understand that you can't just throw any connect any speaker in here and so the, anyway the field coil the output transformer and the audio signal come through this cable here the field coil is running on the same voltage as this output transformer give or take so around 375 volts is going through this field coil and that reduces the hum. I, I say that it's actually not that high. I take that back. It's between two of the filter capacitors. So they go from 375 to B plus, the high voltage, from ground to 375 volts. And there's a couple of them. This coil connects between two of those. So they're sitting at 375 volts. So this field coil has around from the chassis to the coil about 375 volts but across the two wires of the coil very little voltage anyway okay so that's what we got to work with you've seen what's going on with the hum you've seen what's going on with the tuning that's a string that's in here that is slipping on a pulley and so it's not turning uh, everything else looks okay Somebody's definitely worked on it. They've got new bushings in here underneath the chassis there. That's good. So that helped. We've got a new line cord. That's good. I'm not sure how they connected it, but on the transformer set, it really is not that big of an issue. This is an isolation transformer, just like what I got in there. Actually, mine is sitting on the floor. That's, that's a auto transformer there that I can control the voltage, and that feeds an isolation transformer that I got sitting underneath there. That big gigantic guy back there is an isolation transformer, sort of like all transformers are isolation transformers. And um, they're not all one-to-one -one matched. The big one I got is one-to-one -one matched. This is one-to-whatever, one-to-three or one-to-four, something like that different and anyway the good thing is when it was humming that light bulb was not lighting at all which means that it was not there's no short if I plug this back in turn my voltage up and I cut this wire and just short the wires together nothing would happen except the light bulb would light so any short in the radio that light bulb protects the radio because the electricity would go through the light bulb and it'd be just like any light bulb, right? So it would steal the voltage that would do damage to the unit. And that's why you don't power these up without something like that. You got to have a current limiting light bulb or you could blow one of these to smithereens just plugging it in. This one's okay. It's not hurt. At least not that way. So, what I need to do, change the electrolytics, change the wax and paper capacitors, check this transformer, make sure it's putting out correct, which it sounds like it is. Check these transformers, these are transformers in these cans. Make sure that they're all, these four cans, are doing what they're supposed to do, that there's no short, uh, problem there, no open or short in these coils and these transformers. Then i got to change the... Um, tuning string, get the string working, and then I need to tune these to the frequencies that they need to be tuned to. And I use a signal generator, which is that guy back there, a frequency counter, which so I can get the frequencies that these cans are designed for, and a, an oscilloscope in order to see the waveform, so if need be. So a lot of times I don't need that. Um, but I do need the signal generator frequency counter to get these tuned. And when we get these tuned, then the reception will be a lot better on this radio. Because right now, it's, it's surely out of tune. Anyway, that's where I'm at. So I wanted you to see um, 
what I go through when I put one on the bench. This is what I uh, evaluate. This is the diagnostic stage. The next part of it is after I get the chassis out of this case so I can look inside the chassis. And uh, I'll keep in touch. Thanks for watching. Okay, one other thing. I laid this on its side to get these screws out to take the chassis out. And I noticed that there's a big old gap here. So you can see right inside. Let me shine right in there. See that? And I reached in there and tried to move that. You see my fingers. It's not wanting to move. So I don't know um, when this was worked on, if they put the wrong glass in there or what. It looks like the right bevel of glass, but I just wanted to point that out. That's something else that have to be addressed or at least checked. Hey, right, thanks. Okay, we're continuing the diagnostics on this radio, this Philco. I got it out of the case, and this is the bottom. The good news is, uh, this hasn't been tampered with um, very much. There's two things that I see that look like they're not original. And a couple things that I see that tell me that this radio has been used with, uh, with the hum going on for a while. Um, but not bad, not bad, nothing bad. Okay, the first thing is this guy here. This is an electrolytic capacitor. You see it says dry electrolytic cap uh, capacitor. Okay, and it's a... 30 microfarad at 450 volts, and the voltage has to be higher than the radio voltage so it does, so it don't burn it out, right? So it's 450 because the radio runs at around 370. Okay, that's number one, and you notice that it connects here. They got it connected with this chintzy red wire to the center of the tone control here, which is about right. And they got it going to this uh, tube, which I believe is the output tube. Yep. And you see they overheated it. You see that in there? It kind of got... That just needs to be cleaned out of there. All right. This is going, by the way. We're not going to use that. That's <laughs> ridiculously large itself. So normally when I see something like this put in, uh, it's old work. Old work being 1960s, 1970s maybe. This looks like it's recent because that's not a very old wire. This red wire. and But this is just really not good. However, the sides of this capacitor says that this capacitor is old, which means it was probably old when they use it because one giveaway made in USA, right? <laughs> anyway, um... And so, it's got to go. Now, the can is here, underneath this. See here, you see that little circle here where my finger is? Let's see if I can get my finger on it. Yep, down here. See that cut out in there? This is a terminal. That's a terminal. Those are, they're in a circle. They're behind this wax capacitor here. There's a bunch of them, and that's what this is, this metal can. It, it, it actually, that's the bottom, and that's the connections. Okay. So they, were, they put this in, and it probably was meant to replace one of those in that can back in there. That you can't see, but it's back up in there, behind it. It's in there. These wires coming out are coming out of the bottom of that well, they're connected to the terminal on the bottom of that can, these, these wires here. So this wire, this red wire, probably went to one of those, and actually there it is, right there. See this red wire coming out of that can? Can you see that, that red wire right there? It's coming out of the bottom of the can, and it's going to the center of this. So all they did was they put this in, across the bad one. Instead of cutting the bad one out and just putting this in, they left the bad one in. That big no-no. If that bad one was shorted or about to be shorted, this isn't going to matter. Now let me show you some other things. This guy here, dangling around, that's not factory. This guy was replaced. 
Now, he was probably not replaced at the same time this was replaced. He could have been replaced a decade earlier or whatever, but or it might have been the same guy. It's, I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm saying it, it might not have been. And the problem with him is he's like this, hanging down. If that wire, you see that sleeve moves, touches this, who knows what that would fry, right? It's not supposed to touch anything. And this wire here could touch this. You know, it could touch this resistor. And again, you just shorted these two pins together by that, that was touching. Even if it touched up here and didn't touch the other wire, but touched this metal, exposed metal, it's the same thing. It's a short. So this is not factory. Now, however, this may be a factory capacitor because it says Zenith. But, and see, it's broken, but that's all right, I'm going to change all of them. Uh, it, it may, oh, actually, the one in there is cut. See that? It's cut off. So, they cut that one off, and they put this one in its place. This one originally was connected here, and where this one is connected. And the other end of it connected down there, which probably comes up here. Here's a wire. Well, that that was there. Okay, that goes like that. So that one probably went bad, and they put this one in. This is a zenith, but it's not the same as these. See these? I got a long space here for this sides. See that? And look, this one's got a short space. So this didn't come out of this radio. It was added later. But it is a zenith capacitor. Not that that matters. Any capacitor will work. Okay, so these got to go. The other problem with these guys is they melt. And you see this one melted here. It's pitted. You see that one's got a hole on the side there where it blew out with some of the electrolytic. Some of these will drip on the inside of the case. I don't see any on the inside of the case, but sometimes they'll drip. They'll get hot, melt, and drip. It's wax. And it boils if it gets too much power, more than it's designed for. So they got to be changed. Look at this one. See, that one got really hot. See how black and goo gooey that is? You see it from the side view here? Again, sorry for the shaky camera. It's just the only way for me to really get a good move it around and show you what I'm looking at. I can't do that with a tripod that easily. Okay. Well, so we know there's problems there that have to be addressed. Some of the problems are also obvious, and that is things like this. You see how this paint is flaked right off this power resistor? See, it's all cracked, and it's missing here. That's because this resistor got really hot. This resistor is in between um, those electrolytics. This is a, uh, a power resistor on the B-plus line. It got hot. Um, notice this resistor here, see, I don't know if you can see that, but the purple line, it's yellow, purple, yellow, which means it's 470K. The purple is swollen and the yellow is cracked there. This, this resistor has gotten overheated and it's not a dog bone resistor. See how this one's shaped like a bone? It's got ridges on both ends. They, look, they call these dog bones. Those are original. See this one in here? It's a dog bone. See it's burnt in the middle? It's black and the red's gone. It got hot. This this is not a dog bone. This is um, a Bradley, called the Bradley resistor. It's a composite resistor. This was added later. This is not original. And it got overheated probably because that one's bad. So you get some bad resistors too, but not a lot. Um, this one here, even though... It's not a dog bone. It is original. This has a neg um, well, it's like a negative coefficient. So when this one gets hot, its value goes up. This value goes down, and they kind of compensate. They they connect together. You see, and it's sort of like like sandpapery. You know, it's kind of like rough. That's because of the composite material they used back then. It's not like a Bradley. They didn't have those yet. So it needs to go. And the reason it needs to go is because it's going to be out of tolerance. It's pitted because it is porous. And back then it didn't matter. It was new. 
But today it matters. It's porous, so moisture can get through it. And moisture is the worst thing to any electronic system. So moisture can get in there and change its value, which I'm pretty sure it already has, because you see how nice and clean the brown is here? And this should be brown just as clean, and it's not. Okay. And it looks like it got hot. See, it's got words on it, and you can't hardly even read them. But the red, black, and brown look nice and shiny like they would have originally. So this joker got hot too. Um, and so there's a few resistors, but there's not a lot. I mean, one, two, three, four. You see, there's not a lot of resistors. There's a couple more. There's a Bradley here that was put in, and it seems to be okay. A lot of these resistors are fine, won't need to be changed. Just these this one behind it. So this might have had originally Bradley resistors because I'm seeing a lot of them. So it might have been when they just started coming out. And they might have been using the dog bone resistors for the bigger resistors. It could be that Zenith had these in stock and still had them and was still using them while they were using the newer resistors. I mean, that's possible. This is the dial string that I was talking about that's slipping. Let me see if I turn the dial here. You see how that string wraps around this pulley. You'll also notice that it's frayed. See, it's frayed here. Okay, that ain't a big deal, but you can tell it's slipping. See, it stopped turning there. The, string, the pulley turns, but the string don't. So that's the end of the dial there. Watch this furry part there. Oh, it's not even moving now, see? But if when it does move, as soon as it gets to that that pulley, then it don't turn. And on the other side of that, you see that big old knot? I can't get it down here. Uh, let's see. I don't want to come down because the dial ain't turning that far. Oh, there we go. See that big old knot? How in the world is that going to go over that pulley, right? So somebody had worked on that dial string. And it's the knot is what's stopping it. It's hitting that pulley there. And I turn it the other way and it's hitting that up there. So that dial string's got to go. Um, all right. That's what we got. And that's what I'm going to work on. So I just wanted to show you that. Um... Another obvious glaring thing to me is this here. Two reasons. One, well, three. One, this is a Mallory capacitor. See that? It says Mallory on it. You see it there? Two, it's plastic. It's not paper. It's a plastic capacitor. It's still wax, still got to go, still bad. But it was added later. And the reason I even knew it was there, and I couldn't see it because with my eye view, it's behind this. I had to bend over to see it. Is because of this solder joint. That's definitely not factory. Look at that chunk of solder, big old glob. See this? I can get my screwdriver in between the lead or the... See that? Look at that. See how loose that is? That is not even soldered. That's just barely making a mechanical connection. And all of this rosin in here see all that powdery stuff that's flux from when they soldered it that's insulating them so this capacitor is not even making a good connection to ground there that's just sloppy so whoever put that one in didn't know what they were doing and again that may not that may have been done at a different time than this which may have been done at a different time than this i mean you know but radio's got age it's got history it's like us, right? We go to the doctor all our life for different things, and in the end, we got all kinds of patchwork. <laughs> so, there we, there we are. Those are the issues that have to be fixed. Not seeing anything else blaring, but those are the ones. So, this is what we do in a diagnostic. So, the reason I'm recording this video is twofold. It's one for the owner, especially, so he can see what we got to work on. But it's also to help others learn how to do diagnostic when they're working on these. So I may end up putting this as two different videos because it's a little long for one. But I did want to show it. And for all those people who get upset and give me comments about, oh, you need to get a tripod. I hope I explained why I don't. 
And if you can't handle the jitteriness and me moving the camera around, I apologize for that. But uh, the education factor is more important than a pretty picture. You need to be able to see what I'm showing you. You need to. Be, I need to be able to move this at 360 degrees if I have to. You can't do all that with a tripod. So I apologize for that. But um, when I can use it, I do. But when it's something like diagnostic, I have to move it just like I have to move my eyeball to these different spots. So just understand that. All right, thanks for watching. Hope you all have a great day.